theory. Today we're going to look at a nice number theory problem which comes from the 2017 Ecuadorian Math Olympiad. And what I like about this problem is that it involves lots of really interesting tricks along the way towards a solution. Okay, so let's see what we have. Our goal is to find all primes p such that p squared minus p plus 1 is a perfect cube. Now, to get off the ground, we're going to use the following lemma, which we will prove. And that says that if p is a prime and p divides the product of two integers a and b, then p either divides a or p divides b. Okay, so let's get to the proof of this lemma. So let's start by supposing that p divides this product of a and b. Now we're going to break this down into two cases. Our first case is going to be completely trivial, which is the case that p divides a. And of course, if p divides a, then we've already satisfied our conclusion and we're good to go. And so that means that the second case is a little bit more interesting, which is the case when p does not divide a. Okay, well, if p does not divide a, then that means that the greatest common divisor, otherwise known as the GCD, of p and a is equal to 1. But now we're going to use something called Bayes' lemma to find integers x and y such that px plus a times y equals 1. So let's recall that Bayes' lemma says that the GCD of two integers can always be written as a linear combination of those integers. So that's exactly what we've done here. Okay, so now let's also recall that we started by assuming that P divides A times B, but that means that A times B is equal to P times Z for some integer Z. Okay, but now we'd like to put these two kind of like givens together, or these two things that we've come up with together. This one as a linear combination of P and A, together with the fact that A times B is a multiple of P. So how could we do that? Well, perhaps we could take this equation right here and multiply it by y. If we multiply it by y, we'll have a term that looks like a times y, and then we can somehow put these two equations together. Okay, so multiplying by y, we will have a times y times b is equal to p times y times z. Okay, and then we can expand this a times y out into 1 minus p times x using our expression over here. Okay, but that means that we have b equals, let's see, p times xb plus y times z after moving some things around. But notice that means that b is a multiple of p, which is the same thing as saying p divides b. So let's see, we started with p divides the product, and we showed that either p divides a or p divides b, which is exactly what we needed to do to prove this lemma. Okay, so now that we've done that, let's get into the solution of our problem. So let's recall that we wanted this object p squared minus p plus 1 to be a perfect cube. So I'll call that perfect cube n cubed. So in other words, we're supposing that we have a natural number n so that, you know, this is the cube of n. But now we're going to do two things we're going to subtract one from both sides and then factor both sides kind of in an obvious way, maybe obvious for the setup. So subtracting one from the left will leave us with p squared minus p. That kind of factors as p times p minus one. That's maybe the obvious way to factor that. Then if we subtract one from the right hand side, we'll have n cubed minus one, which factors like a difference of cubes. So we have n minus one times n squared plus n plus one. Again, that's the standard factorization for a difference of cubes.
But now notice the left-hand side is a multiple of P, which means the right-hand side is also a multiple of P. So that gives us our setup, P divides N minus one times N squared plus N plus one. But now we've got P divides a product of two things, which means it must divide one of them. So let's break those down into cases. So let's say our first case is the case when P divides N minus one. So let's notice if P divides N minus one, we have N minus one equals P times X. But now let's roll that back into our equation up here. So we have P times P minus one equals P times X times N squared plus N plus one. But from here, we can cancel the P's from both sides of the equation. And we have P minus one is equal to X times N squared plus N plus one. But that means that P minus one is bigger than or equal to N squared plus N plus one, given that X is bigger than or equal to one. I didn't say that here, but here X must be a natural number, just given the fact that we're working within natural numbers here. Okay, nice. But now let's notice that from this right here, we see that P is less than or equal to N minus one, which means that P minus one is less than or equal to N minus two. So that's because divisibility not only gives you this condition, but it, only give, but it also gives you this inequality when you're working within the natural numbers. So now let's put that together with the inequality we have down here, which gives us the inequality n squared plus n plus one is less than or equal to n minus two, which leads to the inequality n squared plus three is less than or equal to zero. But that's clearly a problem because n squared plus three itself is bigger than or equal to three. So we could move this out here and say this is bigger than or equal to three. And then if we read this here, we have three is less than or equal to zero, which like I said, is a contradiction. But that means that this first case is actually impossible. So if P does not divide N minus one by our lemma, that means this second case is the only possible case. So in other words, we have P must divide N squared plus N plus one. So let's see what we get out of that. So that means that we have N squared plus N plus one equals P times X. Again, for some natural number X. Here we're reusing the variable X, but it's a different natural number in this case. Okay, but now we'll loop this equation back into this and see what simplification we get. So we have P times P minus one is equal to N minus one times N squared plus N plus one, but we'll use that. So that's equal to P times X times N minus one. Now we can cancel the P's from both sides. And that leaves us with P equals, let's see, N times X minus X plus one after putting it all together. Now, what will we do from here? Well, let's take this expression for P and loop it back into this equation that we have up here based on our divisibility condition, which is from the case that we're working on right here. Okay, so let's see where that leaves us. We'll have n squared plus n plus one equals, let's see, multiplying this by x because we have px will give us nx squared minus x squared plus x. Okay, so that's pretty nice. Now let's view that as some sort of quadratic equation where n is the variable. So that means we'll have n squared plus one minus x squared times n, and then plus x squared minus x plus one equals zero. So again, we've got a quadratic equation for n where we have coefficients one for the n squared term, 
one minus x squared for the n term, and then this quadratic x squared minus x plus one for the constant term. But now we can apply the quadratic formula and we'll see that n is equal to one half times x squared minus one plus or minus what we get from squaring one minus x squared and subtracting four times one times x squared minus x plus one. So I'll let you guys do the calculation, but what you end up with is x to the fourth minus six x squared plus four x minus three. Okay, so notice that we have this following condition. So this n is a natural number if and only if this expression in here, f of x equals x to the fourth minus six x squared plus four x minus three is a perfect square. So that means what we need to do now is figure out which natural numbers x make this expression a perfect square. And we'll do that using one of my favorite tricks. Okay, so just to reiterate, we'd like to find natural numbers x so that f of x, which is x to the fourth minus six x squared plus four x minus three is a perfect square. And we'll do this by bounding this between two consecutive perfect squares. And so let's bring those into existence. So let's consider this thing that I'll call g of x, which is x squared minus three squared, and this thing which I'll call h of x, which is x squared minus two squared. So notice those are most definitely consecutive perfect squares when x is a natural number. Now let's see why we chose this first one. So it's because when we multiply this out, we get x to the fourth minus six x squared plus nine we pair off the first two terms of f of x. So that means that combines nicely with f of x. And then we choose the second one just because it's consecutive to the first one. So this is x squared minus, or x to the fourth minus four x squared plus four. Okay, now let's consider f of x minus g of x. So like I said, now we're gonna look at f of x minus g of x. So doing a pretty straightforward calculation, we'll see that this is four x minus 12. But notice that four x minus 12 is strictly bigger than zero for x bigger than or equal to four. Okay, but that means that, let's see, f of x, is bigger than or equal to g of x for those values of x. Now, not just bigger than or equal to, but strictly bigger than. And now let's compare f of x with h of x to see what we have. So let's do h of x minus f of x. So if we do a simplification there, we'll see that we get two x squared and then minus four x minus seven. And I won't check this explicitly, but I'll let you check that. And you'll check that this is itself positive or bigger than zero, again, for all values of x bigger than or equal to four. So let's see. That means that we have, in the end, um, g of x is strictly less than f of x, which itself is strictly less than h of x, for all x bigger than or equal to four. But now putting that back into terms of what g of x and h of x are, that means that we have x squared minus three squared is strictly less than f of x, x which is strictly less than x squared minus two for x bigger than or equal to four. Again, if x is bigger than or equal to four, f of x is strictly between these two consecutive perfect squares. So putting that together, we see that f of x is not a square for all x bigger than or equal to four. So that means if f of x which is x to the fourth minus x squared plus four x minus three is not a perfect square for all x bigger than or equal to four, 
then we're only left with three possibilities for x, given that x was a natural number in the first place. So like I said, we'll have x equals one, x equals two, or x equals three. But that's manageable to check which ones of those give perfect squares, you know, just by hand. So if we plug x equals one into f of x, we'll see that we would get the number negative four. But we're working over integers here. We're not working over Gaussian integers. So this is not a perfect square. So plugging in x equals two, we'll get negative three. But negative three is not a perfect square any way you look at it. So our only hope is x equals three. Now, it might be possible this doesn't give us a perfect square and thus our solution is that there's no possible primes. But luckily, if we look at x equals three, we'll see that f of three is equal to 36, which is clearly equal to six squared. So that is a perfect square. So that means we're good to go here. Now we're gonna go back to our relation of x with n. So let's recall we had n squared plus one minus x squared times n plus x squared minus x plus one equals zero. Okay, so rolling our value of x into this, recall that our value of x that works here is x equals three we'll see that we have the quadratic equation n squared minus eight n plus seven equals zero. But that factors quite nicely. So that factors as n minus seven times n minus one equals zero, which tells us that n equals one or n equals seven. So we have those possibilities to work out. But now let's recall the setup that we're working with here which was p divided n squared plus n plus one. And in fact, what we had here was n squared plus n plus one was equal to p times x. But recall that x was equal to three. So here we have three times p is equal to n squared plus n plus one. So let's see, if we plug in n equals one into this, we'll see that we have three times p equals three, but that means that p is equal to one. But p equals one is not a prime number. We don't take one to be a prime number, which means we need to look at the next case. So the n equals seven case. And if we roll that in there, we'll get three p is equal to, let's see, 49, plus seven plus one. So that's gonna be 57. But if three P is equal to 57, we see that P is equal to 19. So that's our only possible value of P. And then maybe just to finish this whole thing off is check that this possible value of P actually works. And we can do that by computing 19 squared minus 19 plus one and showing that that's a perfect cube. But by our construction, it's guaranteed to be a perfect cube. And recall that it was the n cubed for the value of n that we configured. So that would be seven cubed. So that means we have a solution. Okay, so now before I leave you, let's look back at our original problem and see if we can tweak it a little bit to leave you with a homework exercise. I think maybe a nice homework exercise would be to find all primes p so that if we replace this p squared minus p with a p squared plus p, we get a perfect cube. So maybe does that work out to give you any sort of nice solution? Maybe play with it if you'd like to and post your results in the comments. And that's a good place to stop. 
Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.